Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. It means so much to me. As most of you know, I do not charge witnesses for their witness sketches because I just don't feel it's appropriate. So you joining, sketching en encounters, and becoming a teammate helps me, of course, because it provides me the means that I can continue to move forward and grow my channel, and then we can reach more people. And then, of course, I want to share all of those things with you guys. So again, thank you so much for being here. So today's report, I'm just going to jump right in and read from this report. Um, I actually picked up this report myself. Um, it was filed in 2010, but the report actually happened in uh, 1976. By the time I reached out to this person who had filed the report, um, his number was no longer available, so I could not reach him and so therefore it couldn't be published. This takes place in uh, Real County in Texas, which is a few miles from Lost Maples. If anyone's been to Lost Maples State Park, what a beautiful, beautiful area. Tons of people travel there in the fall because the colors are just so extraordinary. This is the body of the report. Back in 1976, I was a kid in Uvalde, Texas, I guess around 10 years old. My granddad and uncle had bought about 900 acres of thick, untouched country near the area where Lost Maples State Park is located today. The ranch was basically three valleys divided by pretty tall hills or slash mountains, thick with oaks, maples, walnut, cedar, mountain laurel, lots of game, two live creeks. From the time I was seven or eight, I roamed the ranch with an over under 410 slash 22 and was hell on small game, a real Daniel Boone. I also hunted deer alone and by the age of 10, I could drive anything on the ranch that had wheels, Jeep, truck, tractor. The ranch would be leased to hunters for the first time ever in 1976. A rich man from Houston who owned a obviously an affluent plumbing company leased it from us and it was their first deer lease ever. The guy and his two grandsons brought three camper trailers at the deer camp. They had hunted before, but had never owned had never on their own lease. So, granddad used to get a kick out of them because they were so happy and gun ho to be on the ranch. They worked hard. They cleared shooting lanes and set up the ranch to their liking for their deer season. The rich guy had a younger stepson that he was wanting to get on his first deer kill. The kid was a senior in high school, and I remember really looking up to him. He was a football stud at the high school in Houston. Opening day of deer season in 1976, the dad put his steps on in a blind up in the head of the thickest valley canyon on the ranch. It was very woolly, very remote, but maybe half a mile from the ranch house. It was about 30 minutes before dark, and me and granddad and the kid's dad were all hanging out at the barn talking and listening for the kid's rifle boom. And then, bam, it happened, and it was the kid. So granddad fires up the Jeep, and the three of us go to pick up the kid. It took about 15 minutes for us to get there, driving slow ranch roads and having to open and close gates. We pull up, and the boy is kneeling down, sobbing. I jumped out and ran to him to see what he killed. Here's what I saw. The kid was kneeling down next to a deer hindquarter that looked freshly torn off a deer. It was very bloody, sinews and tendons hanging from being ripped off the deer. This boy is dazed and shaking. He had peed and defecated himself. Uh, and he put in parentheses, I, I found that out by sitting by him in the Jeep. He cried all the way back to the house. Granddad called the game warden, and I went home unexpectedly that night with my mom because things were really strange, and the grown-ups were whispering. The hunters left that night, too, trailers and all. They hooked up, and they were gone, and they never came back. And I was never allowed to go anywhere on that ranch, day or night, unless a grown-up was with me. Granddad said the kid got out of his blind and was fooling around by the creek with a pack when a pack of wild hogs came through fighting over the deer meat. And the boy shot at them and then cried because he was scared. Wild hogs were very rare in that country in those days, but that was the reason I was told. The hunters freaked out and left, and also 
why I couldn't be alone in the woods anymore. After I grew up, the ranch was sold in 1989. I guess I was college age. My grandparents told me what really happened. And just see if you can get your mind around this. The kid told his dad and my granddad the following happened. He said, and this is in quotes, I see a lone six-point buck. I shoot him in the neck and he falls down. I get out to look at him and I'm really excited. And I knelt down to look at the antlers. I hear leaves crunching coming my way and I thought it was an animal. But then it registered it was men walking towards me and I yelled, hey, thinking it was maybe some other hunters that had heard me shoot. When I saw it was two huge creatures one was a little taller than the other, but both were enormous, standing seven to eight feet tall. They walked to within a few feet of me, and the bigger one reached for me, and I just started crying. I couldn't move. I couldn't speak. It was actually reaching for the deer. It was really ugly, but more caveman-looking than ape. I would not look at him, though. I wanted no eye contact. The bigger one snatched the deer up under its arm like a small sack of potatoes. It turned and started to leave. The two were making some weird language, chattering back and forth like they were irritated with each other or arguing. I sat there sobbing in fear and in a disbelief as they paused. Then the bigger one walked straight for me, and I figured that they had decided to, to get me too. I peed and defecated myself when he stood towering over me. He repositioned the deer so that he was clutching it upside down in a one-armed bear hug. He then stuck his thumb deep into the deer's rectum, and with a smooth motion, I hear bone breaking, and he neatly and quickly removed a hindquarter with huge, powerful hands. He set it in front of me, and then the two were gone in a few seconds, out of sight, and without any sound. And then y'all showed up in the Jeep. The end of quotations. Um, he noted, this was in the field notes, very interesting that the game warden did come out and view the site and took the hindquarter and was told all that had happened. He witnessed the hunters leaving for Houston in a hurry at nine o'clock that night on opening weekend of deer season. Yes, it is a fact the hunters all left that night, and he put that exclamation point, exclamation point. And they never came back for their blinds or their feeders either. Granddad said he called the game warden a bunch of times, and when he finally got a hold of them to ask about the incident, the game warden said, in quote, You mean that partial deer carcass those poachers left? Question mark and end of quotes. And he acted like, that's all it was, and then he seemed to always have avoid my grandfather after that. So can you imagine being that poor 17 or 18 year old, basically child, so excited about his first deer kill and then, you know, get your deer and be kneeling down by it. Can you imagine two creatures that are seven to eight feet, foot tall that you probably didn't even know existed you know, hair covered and looking Neanderthal looking, walking right up to you and they're talking to each other and you don't know what they're discussing. I mean, you don't know what they're doing. You're thinking, you know, you're about to die. I just, oh my gosh, my heart goes out to, you know, this person. And uh, what do y'all think? I mean, welcome to the unpublished files. And again, thank you so much for being here. And please leave any any, uh, any suggestions in the comments about what you'd like to see and what you'd like to hear. And I'm going to continue to record these, these cached files. I love you guys so much. And thank you so much for being here. <laughs>